good evening everyone uh, on behalf of indian association for veterinary dermatology and uh, intas pharmaceutical i welcome all of you for this uh, dermatology webinar uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, clients with the uh, uh, food allergy as a common uh, attendees in our uh, clinic in our day to day practice we are facing lot of problems and uh, generally uh, they won't say it is a food allergy they'll be saying as a pyoderma they will be presented as a pyoderma or malassezia like that uh, they will be thinking and uh, giving you an appearance and while thorough examining it and uh, thorough asking questions and uh, what are all the food introduced newly all those things has to be focused more on identifying the problem with that we'll have a very grand success in that because food allergy is uh, unlike uh, atopy if you are going to treat uh, identify the problem properly it is easy to cure completely that is the very important thing here so we thought we'll be uh, having on uh, session with the cutaneous adverse food reaction in companion animals that is today we have uh, a speaker who is having a very good interest in uh, allergic dermatitis and he has worked uh, with me in uh, research in allergic dermatitis and also he worked under me in our uh, clinic uh, for quite some time and uh, he was having uh, enormous interest in allergic dermatitis in small animals he is nothing but dr balaguru i invite him uh, wholeheartedly and also i invite uh, dr nitin patia and amit uh, manjot singh doctor uh, for the show and i request our uh, dr nitin patia to introduce the speaker thank you you are mute i think dr nagraj is the best person to introduce uh, ala dr bala guru still i'll just briefly introduce uh, dr bala guru uh, dr bala guru is a veterinary graduate and a post graduate from chennai uh, he is a post graduate in veterinary clinical medicine under dr nagraj itself and uh, he specializes on canine allergic skin, uh, skin diseases He is also a post-graduate diploma holder in small animal orthopedics, Sutter College. He has a passion towards canine allergic diseases. With that intent, he has also been working with Dr. Nagraj as an associate veterinary clinician. Later on, he has joined the industry and served the various companies and uh, is working in the sector of not taking you. not to stay between you and uh, doc uh, and this presentation i'll hand it over to them to bala guru for taking up of session it should be a good session on cutaneous food allergies and its interpretations over to doc thank you thank you dr nitin thank you dr nagraj sir uh, for having me here thank you so much and uh, i would also thank uh, you know uh, abd and intas for giving me this opportunity to share their experience and knowledge whatever i gained uh, you know during the past years in allergic uh, you know diseases of companion animals and uh, welcome everyone once again and uh, yeah let us uh, start the session on cutaneous adverse food reactions let me share my screen now yes so cutaneous adverse food reactions in companion animals so the agenda what we are going to discuss is today well not let's see shared not yet shared okay one second so on the chain okay is it visible Yes. Yeah. So cutaneous adverse food reactions, as Dr. Nagrajan has mentioned it, it's a one of the commonest allergic, you know, skin diseases of dogs and cats. Nowadays, we are usually getting into the practice, and it is also presented in a different, uh, you know, uh, with the secondary, with the different secondary bacterial or secondary fungal or yeast infest infections. Sometimes it is challenging, you know, because it is also sometimes it is challenging because it is also be 
presented in a combination of other 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 allergic skin diseases as well. So today is the right. I think uh, we have to discuss and understand the basics and uh, you know how do we uh, first uh, uh, understand the concepts about the food allergy and then let us see the clinical signs and diagnostic methods and how do we manage these patients which are actually you know itching and feeling uncomfortable and to give them a healthy lifestyle okay that is what you know the agenda it goes like this so first let me in, in, uh, give us some introduction and basics about the uh, on the skin diseases allergic skin diseases then let's see the food allergy definition and then we'll see the classification of dietary hypersensitivity and uh, where food allergy falls under and then we'll see the prevalence common food allergens signalment and cutaneous signs of uh, food allergy and also we'll also see the non cutaneous clinical signs and then we'll move on to the diagnostic methods right now available but which are useful which are not useful let us have a quick uh, you know view about that and then we'll go for the differential diagnosis how to narrow it down to a food allergy and then how do we go further to select a elimination diet and then we'll also discuss on the you know different elimination diets which are available and what are all the pros and cons of using those uh, you know um, elimination diets which are available and then duration of the food trial how much time you have to wait how much time you have to actually you know put the dog or a cat under a food trial and then how much time you have to wait for the allergens to trigger the flare or trigger the uh, inflammation and uh, elimination diets sometimes also you know gives us uh, you know the wrong uh, uh, diagnosis because of a lot of reasons so reasons to failure that is also we'll discuss is it because of the contamination of the food is it because of any cross reactivity or is it because we have chosen the right protein or molecular size is reduced all these things we'll discuss and then finally we'll see the extensively hydrolyzed protein feather how is it going to help then finally we'll see the practical you know tips for you know identifying and understanding the uh, uh, cutaneous adverse food reaction yes as i have mentioned the cutaneous adverse food reactions is one of the commonest allergic skin diseases of the pets so and it is also a common cause for pets to visit our veterinary clinics in day to day practice it could be because of you know cutaneous adverse food reactions or it could be also because of cutaneous uh, canine atopic dermatitis or feline atopic dermatitis for that matter so sometimes it could be a combination of both as well so eliminating you know what is actually causing the itching in the pets is what we have to focus manifested sometimes this food allergies are manifested sometimes with or without gi signs vomiting diarrhea flatulence yeah, happen sometimes sometimes not and itchy pets you know it's not comfortable for the owners as well as the, for the for the pets to just you know watch their pets itching and scratching themselves and hurting themselves making that making it you know worse worsening the condition so so what are all the common causes of skin conditions so we have different uh, you know causes the majority is allergic causes and we have parasitic infestations and also hormonal causes infectious causes and also sometimes genetic causes which could which so these are all the common allergic conditions or common skin conditions that we get in our day to day practice so we must have to understand how to differentiate and narrow it down so let us go and see the definition first of the cutaneous adverse food reactions the cutaneous adverse food reactions are recognized as non seasonal so it is non seasonal that means it will be available throughout the year so that is one of the important you know parameter for a clinician to look into and it is pruritic yes of course it will be you know causing the inflammation and to initiate the itching process in the dogs and cats and sometimes it may or may not accompany skin lesions skin lesions may not be there sometimes so that we should not be you know missing the right focus on cutaneous adverse food reactions as i mentioned already these cutaneous adverse food reactions also can cause gi upsets respiratory or sometimes urinary tract and neurological problems okay so now we see what is a food allergen the food allergen is something which can trigger an allergic reaction in a sensitized patient so sensitized patients if the food allergen enters it can induce a immunological reaction and cause lot of you know its consequences 
So let us see the classification of dietary hypersensitivity now. So the dietary the hypersensitivity is broadly classified into immunological and non-immunological. So the immunological means immune mediated. Example is our food allergy. This food allergy could be triggered either through IgE mediated mechanism that could be your immediate type hypersensitivity. IgE mediated mast cell deglandulation and shared itching. Yeah, that could be a type one and non IgE mediated delayed type hypersensitivity type three and type four, which could be antigen antibody complex and delayed type hypersensitivity type four by T cell activation. And the non immunological goes to food tolerance. The food intolerance can be food idiosyncrasy. A person could be reacting something odd, something new, uh, you know, for the first time in its in his life. So reaction to propylene glycol in cats is a quite good example in companion animals and food poisoning is the second cat category. So the food poisoning either we are when the pets ingested toxic food or could be because of the hyper you know vitaminosis A and D could be or onions and grapes kind of toxic subs food substances when they are you know ingested. And also it could be metabolic. For example, this lactose intolerance. It is because of the post to intolerance, you know, post mechanism to not able to tolerate the level of lactose and not able to digest it properly. And finally, comes to the pharmacological reaction to the foods, like for example, reaction to the vasoactive amine. Sometimes the pets eat some spoiled meat and fish or something like that. They induce or they they, they actually you know produce some vasoactive amines which trigger the allergic causes. Reactions to the Theobromine in chocolates also could be one good example for the pharmacological reactions to food. Yeah. Now let us move on and see about the prevalence of cutaneous adverse food reactions. See the study by Oliveri and Rolf Muller is suggesting that you know dermatosis is one of the commonest problem and it's it can account for up to 24 percentage and the pets which is coming to the clinic uh, the pruritus could be up to 40 percentage. And the allergic causes could be up to 60 percentage and the put up uh, canine atopic dermatitis could be 9 to 50 percentage in dogs. Now let's see in cats the dermatosis normally it's around 3 to 6 percentage and pruritus is about 21 percentage and allergic dermatosis could be 5 to 13 percentage. So the point is prevalence of allergic diseases are very very common in dogs and cats, especially the cutaneous adverse food reactions accounting to up to. 20 to 30 percentage in dogs in cats and 40 percent up to 40 percentage in you know dogs. Yeah. So the that is you know the study which we have seen from the you know uh, global study. So this is the study which it is suggesting that prevalence of allergic dermatosis out of the all dermatology dermatological case came into the clinical setup. Almost 60 percentage, 60 percentage of the cases were allergic dermatosis, and out of these 60 percentage of allergic dermatosis, the cutaneous adverse food reactions was accounted for about almost 80 percentage, more than 80 percentage. This could be because because this could be because of the reason it is a referral unit. Probably the cases which might have you know been referred from some other places would have been much focused here, so that could be the reason for the higher number of prevalence in cutaneous adverse food reactions and also we could also be able to see flea, flea allergy dermatitis about 7 percentage and chemical contact allergy dermatitis around 5 percentage and atopy could be around 4 percentage. And also we could also observe the combinations of allergic dermatosis. Sometimes it could be only cut auto, only food allergy. Sometimes it could be combined with atopic dermatitis, sometimes with flea allergy, sometimes with uh, chemical contact allergy. So these are all the you know you know things which are actually making the diagnosis very difficult or challenging for the veterinarians in the practice setup. Yeah. So now let's see what are all the common allergens identified in dogs and cats. The common allergens identified in dogs and cats seems to be beef. Let's let's first talk about the dog. So the common allergens in dogs are beef and dairy products and chicken. And in cats, if you take the common allergen seems to be beef and fish and chicken. Also, the India, India, Indian studies or Indian practice setup, we could also be able to see 
that the pets which are allergic to some nuts, which is also very common, especially in Indian setup. So we must have to rule out a, a, a thorough diagnos diagnosis should include a thorough history, history of you know food, whatever they are taking, not only from what they are feeding, they also should you know take into consideration what was you know fed as a treat and what is what was given during when the dog was taken into a they can taken for a walk. So everything has to be accounted for. Then only we can actually rule it out and eliminate causes one by one and it narrow down to food alerts. Clinical manifestations. So the clinical manifestations normally account for it could be age starting any any anything from one year from starting from zero months, one month to 13 years of age. Anytime the cutaneous adverse food reactions can actually you know cause the flare. We may think, OK, the dog was actually on the same food only. Why is it happening at a very long time? Yeah, because sometimes it happens. And also the studies suggest that almost 30, 40 percentage of the dogs, almost 40 percentage of the dogs were actually, you know. Started showing the signs of cutaneous adverse food reactions at less than one year of age. So we should not neglect if it is less than one year of age. We should be very, very. You know, cautious in terms of ruling it out and the studies also suggest there are no sex predilections and there are no age and breed predisposition for the cutaneous adverse food reactions but the whatever clinical practice and you know whatever experience so far we have had we could see that lot of labrador retrievers german shepherd golden retriever white island white terrier these are all the commonest affected dog breeds from our clinical indian clinical setup so now let us quickly move on to the clinical signs. So the, in dogs, you can I could observe a pet with food allergy, generalized pruritis, ear infections, very very common ear infections, never 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 can be missed, and the feet affected feet, ventrum, anal pruritus sometimes also you know sometimes anal pruritus is also recorded. Okay, so clients will very very. Clearly, we have to ask the questions, right questions to the clients. We have to ask the clients whether the dog is actually le leaking the pass. Leaking the pass is one of the very important clinical signs which we have to ask for. Whether the dog is leaking its pass, keep on leaking the pass. Is it yes or no? Then we should actually you know, get a right answer. And then second thing we should also ask whether the dogs or cats, they are scratching their face like this sometimes after especially with the you know allergic uh, trigger they start doing like this just a uh, you know facial rubbing and uh, licking the paws and rubbing the face these are all and ears scratching the ears continuously scratching the ears and if you see the exam in the ear there will be definitely erythema and otitis yeah. and in cats majority of the you know cats with the cutaneous adverse food reactions are exhibited in the Proactive faces, faces mostly you know getting affected because of the scratching or because of the miliary you know dermatitis, and heads and necks are very commonly affected, feet and ventrum, and also they also do get ear infections. So, concurrent infections also be possible as I mentioned already. This is also going to be a challenge. Otitis externa will be there because of it could be because of bacterial infection or any other sort of infections, and malasthesia could be there also could be concurrently canine metopic dermatitis. So these are all common clinical signs. So we should ask the right question to the clients, whether the dog is licking the paws, rubbing the face, scratching the ears, or either is it passing in any, any, any loose tools, any flatulent is a bad gas production and smell is coming. So all these questions actually should actually give us a right uh, you know, indication and right direction for the diagnosis. As for the study, we could also observe the predominant clinical lesions, skin lesions, which was observed in atopic and uh, cutaneous adverse food reaction dogs, where erythema, the primary lesions were erythema, and pustules because of the secondary bacterial infections, and self induced alopecia. That is one of the commonest things. Once the itching started, they start itching themselves. They used to you know, damage the skin and self induced alopecia. Lichenification is the secondary because of something it could be because of malasthesia or it could be because of the continuous damage to the skin. Excoriations. 
hyper pigmentations scabs dry skins crust and seborrhea so these are all the primary and secondary lesions that one could see one could actually you know observe when the dog is actually presented with the clinical form of, uh, clinical formation of this cutaneous flares because of the food yeah so you can see these pictures let us see some of the you know pictures which can give us some idea about the understanding of the you know disease so conjunctivitis conjunctivitis is one of the common things and also you could see the erythema and the pustule formations the ear otitis and as i mentioned this is going to be the this here you can see the you know licking the pass and it is got self induced alopecia here and also the here this is the can picture you can see the dog is having a tennis flash third one is a ear erythema and also the secondary bacterial infection yeah. so here the typical case you can see the continuous licking and damaging the front limbs especially licking the front paws is one of the and also you can see the erythema and hyperpigmentation on the back side of the foot it could be also this case could be you know was a case which which was presented with both the combination of cutaneous adverse uh, food reactions and canine atopic dermatitis so here you can see the lichenification so elephant uh, skin kind of uh, lichenification high hyperpigmentation is the case yeah. secondary bacterial infections and patchy alopecia across the you know dogs as a body surface because of the adverse food reactions this it could not miss actually and this dog with the atopic dermatitis as well as the cutaneous adverse food reactions was presented to us and you can see the also secondary malassezia infections and bacterial infection is present in this dog here you can observe the erythema around the you know mouth because of the allergens because of the allergens which a oral food challenge which is not actually suitable for the dog it has made it uh, allergized to, to this particular source of protein and here in this picture we can observe we can see the erythema hyperpigmentation lichenification here in the part because of the malassezia secondary malassezia this was initially diagnosed with the uh, malassezia then later we could narrow it down to uh, you know cutaneous adverse food reactions once the malassezia was treated perfectly and you can also observe the erythema of the ears in this picture yes. epidermal colorates and again licking licking of the pus leading to uh, erythema hyperpigmentations self induced alopecia and this is a typical case with uh, atopic dermatitis and uh, uh, food allergy both uh, were a combination we present so once the food allergens were identified it was the dog was put on to treatment for atopic dermatitis and here you can see the alopecia this 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 dog was with a you know hormonal problem and also had the food allergy this one you can see there is a conjunctivitis around the uh, around the around the eyes you can see typical uh, lesions for the allergies food, especially food allergies peri anal erythema you can observe in this picture so these are all the signs we should actually look for here you can see the self induced alopecia because of continuous licking yes. so we should also rule out acrylic dermatitis in these conditions yeah this again one more case with the you know uh, like continuous licking of the pass and the dog was diagnosed with food allergy yes. again this picture again shows the you know hyperpigmentations and the thickening of the skins because of these uh, food allergy yes. so here also you can see the foot lesions so typical uh, you know atopic uh, lesions around the eyes and around the uh, lips you can observe yes. so typical of uh, uh, cutaneous adverse food reactions you cannot miss anyone cannot miss in, in your practice yes so now let's go and see the typical you know cases in cats cats also as i mentioned clearly cat you can look for majority of the lesions in cat cutaneous food allergy would be around the face and neck 
and sometimes the ventrum is affected. You can also look for a otitis. Yes, you can see the patch alopecia and hyperpigmentation, erythema in this one. Yes, and self-induced uh, uh, self-induced damage and ulceration of the uh, cat with a food allergy. This one also you can observe very nicely. This one is a miliary uh, dermatitis uh, pattern of uh, dermatitis, which is very, very common in food allergy in cats. And also this eosinophilic uh, lesions also can be, eosinophilic plaque lesions also can be observed under uh, ventral abdomen. In, and sometimes, you know, it also presents with the oral ulcer, which one should not be mistaken for a, you know, calcis virus uh, you know, infection in cats. So now let us see the signs of dietary sensitivity. What are all the clinical signs? We have seen the typical clinical signs and lesions. Now we'll see what are what else can be expected. Vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence, sometimes very rarely coughing and sneezing and conjunctivitis, but chronic ear infection, yes, obviously it will be there in the tennis and food reactions. So the Rolf and Kiri Muller, they actually you know studied the non-cutaneous lesions from various uh, previous publications and they found out that diarrhea was one of the most commonest non-cutaneous lesions with uh, dogs and cats. Around 70 to 90 percentage of the dogs were having diarrhea. Blue stools or vomiting was also present predominantly. Less other 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 uh, you know uh, signs non-cutaneous signs were also present like conjunctivitis, sneezing, uh, sometimes tenesmus, all these things, but it was not of majority of concerns or most of the cases were not reported. So the, predominantly you could observe diarrhea or vomiting. And in cats, the same thing, diarrhea and vomiting is predominantly observed. At the same time, you can also see conjunctivitis also up to 22% of the cases. Sometimes it could be drooling, salivating. Yes, sometimes you could also observe respiratory signs and uh, flatulence also. So these are all the non-cutaneous lesions in a dogs with uh, and dogs and cats we have actually have to look for. So yes, as I mentioned already, combinations are always possible. In the study which we had done in 2015 clinical pathological study of uh, atopic dermatitis and food allergy, we could also we could find out the pyoderma was present in almost 80 percentage of the cases, secondary bacterial infections. Yes, and the yeast was predominantly, especially the malassezia yeast infestation infection was there at 60 percentage of the cases. And cutaneous adverse food reactions along with the canonotopic dermatitis was present up to 28 percentage of the cases. And flea allergy reported in 6 percentage of the cases. So we should be always keeping in mind that, you know, this cutaneous adverse food reaction can be majority of the times presented with secondary bacterial infections. And secondary bacterial infection induced, you know, pruritis also will actually worsen the condition. So we have to rule it out and then we have to eliminate the secondary bacterial infections. Either it is pyoderma, yeast or flea allergy or whatever it is. So the diagnosis, yes. So the diagnosis, as I mentioned, detailed history. Detailed history should comprise of the food from morning to evening. You should ask the client. OK, tell me from morning from the time the dog wakes up, what are all the things are being given either by you or by your family member or by your relative or some guest or something, somebody else who is on the stranger on the walk. We have to take a clear history about the food that is being fed to the dog. And then we should also check on the medic medications that the dog or cat is being on. Sometimes the Colorants or you know of flavorants in the uh, tablets or sometimes in the medicines and syrups. Sometimes they might also be a cause of uh, allergens. And then the thorough physical examination is warranted. Thorough physical examinations. One should uh, actually one examine from head to toe with all the you know uh, understanding about the tennis adverse foot reaction. You have to look for lesions, especially in face and licking the paws, rubbing the face. You should ask the right question. Dietary history. And after this, you should actually eliminate the other causes of allergies and other causes of itching, pruritis. So the a skin scraping, uh, ideally a skin scraping is required to eliminate uh, some mites and then a tape impression to eliminate uh, malassezia yeast infection. And then sometimes culture is warranted. Uh, sometimes trichogram also can be of helpful. 
yeah. Uh, so you have to just uh, go through in this order and then bless blood test to rule out, you know, if it, there are any hormonal, uh, you know, disorders. And finally, sometimes skin biopsies also helps to actually confirm it, do the confirmative diagnosis. After all these things, you should, you know, after all eliminating all other causes of pruritus, then we should come to the final thing is the dietary trial, which is very important for diagnosing the food allergy. And if the dog is responded to the dietary trial and we found the allergens, then we can just maintain the dog very nicely. And if not, if it is combined with atopic dermatitis, we should also find out using the intradermal skin test and go for allergen specific immunotherapy. So differential diagnosis for pruritic skin diseases in dogs, ectoparasitic skin diseases. So first we have to rule out all the ectoparasitic skin diseases, starting from fleas, scabies, demodicosis, chalitilosis, pediculosis, otocariasis, trombicloasis, all the ectoparasitic causes which are causing the you know pruritus in dogs and cats should be ruled out first. Then we should treat them we should identify and treat them for secondary microbial infections like the staphylococcal pyoderma or malassezia dermatitis. And we should also rule out flea allergy dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, insect by diaper sensitivity, chemical contact dermatitis, and sometimes neoplastic diseases like cutaneous lymphoma also could be a cause of you know, pruritus in dogs and cats. So one should rule out ectoparasitic diseases, and secondary treat for the secondary and yeast infestations. Also rule out and treat for flea allergy and uh, chemical contact, you know, remove the chemical source of allergen from the you know, pet's vicinity and insect bite allergy, you know, the history of mosquito, all these things should be thoroughly, you know, investigated before we proceed to the, uh, before we go for the confirmatory diagnosis. Flea allergy dermatitis. Normally the flea is presented, you know, as you might have seen in your practice, in the, in the picture also you can see the flea is actually present most of the majority of the presentation will be on the lumbosacral area tail base tail base and the cordomedian thigh and majority it will be a perennial problem yeah and also one should also check you know whether the recent history of travel of pet anywhere traveled with where the you know flea population is higher sometimes you know we should also check with the you know owners about the uh Presence of cats in the you know vicinity of vicinity of the dogs and cats, the vicinity of dogs are one or two kilo because sometimes you know they can actually uh, transfer from the uh, near, nearby pets. Yeah. So one should do the flea combing and uh, if it is identified flea dirt or flea is uh, identified, then we should go for that treatment. And it is suggested that a dog should be on a flea prevention at least for three months prior to you are enrolling them for the. Uh, food induced uh, uh, allergic uh, dietary diet. yes then we should actually rule out the sarcoptis kb sarcoptis kb is generally ruled out if you can go for a super special skin clipping first with the history of the owner whether the owner is also you know um, most of the times the owner is also you know affected and uh, most of the time skin scrapings, uh, super special skin scrapings actually you know, will rule out. And sometimes you can also test and try your anti-parasitic trial treatment, selamectin, oxidectin, ivermectin, amitra, slime sulfur, and uh, some uh, to rule out the sarcoptis KB. First to rule out the severe, you know, pruritus caused by sarcoptis KB. Then look for demodic spaces. Demodic spaces actually a deep burrowing mite. So we have to go for a deep skin spray scraping and uh, Sometimes hair pluckings and skin biopsies also could be of use in terms of identifying and uh, eliminating the pruritus caused by demodic species. And then chelitella, chelitella mostly you know on the you know dorsal surface of the body, coat brushings and sometimes tape impression, sometimes superficial scrapings also you know and uh, hair shaft you can examine for uh, you know the uh, eggs uh, egg grafts you know can be presented in the hair shaft and water ductus. Oral discharge, look for the oral uh, discharge. It will be most of the times dark brown, black color, coffee ground like color. So just go for a, you know, so, you know, swab and then superficial skin scraping. That should rule out all your mites and uh, uh, mites causing the, you know, pruritus in dogs. Yeah. So distribution of lesions, just for, you know, probably we'll quickly see the distributions. Chelitilla. Chelitilla, you can see almost dorsal part of starting from the head to tail, almost dorsal part of the 
uh, you know, say uh, dogs or cats bodies, or dogs bodies affected here. And then you can see the sarcophagus typical around the ears, ear margin lesions and elbows elbow lesions and uh, typical ventral abdominal lesions. This is, uh, you know, this will also rule out uh, sarcophagus. Then this thrombiclosis and autocaryosis. Thrombiclosis is almost on the pass. Most of the times you can diagnose them from the dorsal and ventral aspect of the forms and uh, ventral aspect of the abdomen. Yes. And this uh, autocaryosis majority of the times is around the base of the ear. You have to, you know, actually look for. Them. Yes. So when diagnosing cutaneous adverse food reactions, Bacterial overgrowth is very, very common and yeast infestation is very, very common. We were up, we, in our study, we observed that Bacillus, Pseudomonas, Streptococcus, E. coli were contributing around 40 percentage or 40 to 50 percentage and rest of the bacterial pyoderma was, uh, was contributed by uh, what, uh, Staphylococcus organism. And 58 percentage of the cases were actually presented with secondary malassezia infestation. Malaysia, you can just do the tape impression and you can identify DC. Yes, and rule out. And then comes to the demodicosis. Demodicosis, it could be localized or generalized. You can actually go for a deep skin scraping and uh, uh, treatment would help uh, eliminating the cause. And then Malaysia, most of the times ventral abdomen lesions, uh, starting from the uh, neck to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the ventral, ventral portions, especially the neck area and the axillary areas, okay, are affected. Rule out the malaysia as well. Now let's once after ruling out all these things, we also should rule out canonotopic dermatitis. Canonotopic dermatitis again, you know, is uh, it can be identified using the history and uh, favorite et al criteria that is there is seven criteria there. Uh, favorite et al criteria we have to use and intradermal skin testing for the funding against the funding allergens can be useful. Once the funding allergens have been identified, we should go for allergen specific immunotherapy. So these are all the things one must do before we actually, you know, uh, move on to the dietary elimination. Time. So in cats, normally the food induced uh, hypersensitivity will be presented almost 88 percentage, 100 percentage of the cats were in the you know, face area, neck area and ventral abdomen area. This is the common presentation in cats with uh, food induced allergic dermatitis. So how do we actually diagnose it? How do we actually narrow it down? So we have narrowed it down to, uh, you know, uh, food allergy. Then now we have to actually confirm it by doing a right test. There are a lot of tests which are available. Intradermal skin testing, serum, IgE specific, IgG specific, lymphocyte proliferation test, patch testing. Lots of tests are available. And you can also see there are all negative predictive chances are very, very high. You can see, for example, for IgE, there are about 86 percentage for going for a negative predictability. And similarly, in cats also, we have intradermal test, IgE specific test and lymphocyte polyprosy test. But none of this is actually recommended. None of this recommended. And a thorough study was made and none of this was uh, recommended. Only what is recommended is and the gold standard test to confirm the food allergy is the elimination and provocation. Okay. That is the gold standard test. OK, one should actually don't spend and waste your energy and time in you know doing all the other tests. Just narrow down the. All, all causes of pruritus and then go for a dietary elimination and provocation test. This is the gold standard test. So this gold standard test will confirm whether the pet is having a food allergy or not. <laughs> How to manage the adverse food reactions? So for adverse food reactions, we have three options. One is a food with novel proteins. Second one is a food with hydrolyzed protein. Third one is a food which is actually restrictive home cooked hypoallergenic food. <laughs> what do you mean by novel proteins? So novel proteins, before that, We'll also see what are all the nutrients of concern in managing the dietary sensitivity. So the novel protein or the hydrolyzed proteins, what is the need of it? It actually, this proteins actually provides building blocks and you know without causing any allergy, even if it, if it is sensitized animal. And it can help the pets with food allergy by not eliciting or not you know triggering any allergic immune response. 
high levels of essential fatty acids very much important because essential fatty acids are integral part of the skin and also they do take part in the inflammatory and anti-inflammatory activity to control the skin ongoing inflammation and antioxidants which prevents the cell damage and also make sure we have a healthy immune system and healthy skin integumentary system yeah so novel protein single novel animal protein source what do you mean by novel protein source novel protein is something exotic protein exotic means the pet which is never you know in its lifetime it has never been exposed to them for example novel protein we have normally you know we right now we have uh, commercially available is most of the times chicken is available so we should go for a novel protein like a fish protein or probably a, a pork protein or a duck protein which the animal is already has not been exposed to and then are we sure is it new to the pet this is very important i mean because nowadays a lot of uh, you know commercial diets with the different uh, labelings and different uh, you know protein sources are available sometimes we should miss we, we could also miss are we sure is it new to the pet yeah we should make sure otherwise it will not work and uh, what are all the chances of cross contamination a lot of studies suggest that there are cross contaminations as a, a diet which is uh, you know uh, the label says that it's a protein um, uh, duck, uh, chicken protein it also actually you know uh, shows that it is also containing uh, lamb protein or uh, duck protein so cross contamination should be checked and cross reactivity to other source of animal protein should be also checked and this is again one more important thing is whether it's a complete and balanced food we should always check it so what are all the common and recommended single novel animal protein sources for dogs for dogs the recommended novel protein sources are pork rabbit duck venison and fish and for cats it is pork rabbit venison and duck so in indian conditions we can easily go for a pork rabbit or a duck and fish in dogs and pork rabbit and duck in cats so this is the recommended one when you want to go for a when you go for when you want to choose the right elimination diet for a as a novel protein go for the options recommended for dogs and cats then the second option is the hydrolyzed protein diets what do you mean by hydrolyzed proteins so hydrolyzed proteins are actually you know reduced in the molecular weight their molecular weight is reduced in such a way that it does not elicit or does not you know trigger any allergic response in the or it does not you know uh, uh, cause uh, mast cell degranulation and then in turn produce the allergic response in a dog or cat so that is the process of hydrolyzation which makes them undetected by the you know ige uh, specific antibodies and uh, you know does not create any allergic response so here what is recommended for a hydra for a hydrolyzed diets most of the publications refer that the 10000 less than 10000 kilo dalton's molecular weight less than 10000 kilo dalton molecular weight is actually recommended for a hydrolyzed protein diets but however some studies suggest that even it could be brought down to 3 and 5 kilo daltons you know up to 3 3 3 to 5 kilo daltons 3000 to 5000 kilo daltons which actually you know minimizes the Uh, allergies allergenicity of the diet so extensive hydrolysis is required extensive hydrolysis means it's not a partial hydrolysis i mean it's a complete hydrolysis and make sure the uh, uh, allergen or protein source is not eliciting any allergen and ultra filtration this extensive hydrolysis and uh, ultra filtration is required uh, a lot of investment by the pet food manufacturer so it's expensive that is the reason you know the ultra hydrolyzed protein sometimes seems to be little expensive on the side yeah so how do hydrolyzed proteins work basically we can see in the next animation see when the molecular size of the protein is bigger the ige specific uh, receptors and uh, identified and actually uh, you know trigger mast cell degranulation which causes the allergic reaction so when the molecular size is reduced when the molecular size is reduced you can see the hydrolyzation and ultra filtration after that the molecular size of the protein is reduced in such a way that that does not elicit antigen uh, 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 ig specific reactions and you know mast cell in induced uh, pruritis yes so this is the concept of hydrolyzed protein and then third option what we have is the restrictive home cooked hypoallergenic protein so here a few challenges are there but it is the gold standard and recommended one for the hypo uh, 
hypoallergenic dietary trial, elimination trial for the dogs and cats. But what are all the challenges we have in front of us? Does the owner have time and compliance? First thing, whether sometimes they may not be able to cook for them also, how can they find some time for the pets? We have to check owner's compliance and time availability of them. Cross contamination possible. You know, sometimes we may not be sure where is the source of protein. So cross contamination is possible and it seems to be expensive sometimes based on the raw material availability. And is it complete and balanced? This is what is the one question, but that everyone should ask whether it has got all the essential nutrients that dog or a cat has to have and how is it completely balanced? So that is more important and raw material availability. Yeah, quite challenging sometimes. Sometimes vitamins as availability, all these things. Palatability of the food. This also puts the, you know, our home cooked hypoallergenic food as a challenging one. Yes. So homemade source normally contain one protein and one carbohydrate source. This is the one recommend, very good, very well recommended restrictive home diet for the dogs and cats. Now let us see the pros and cons. What are all the pros and cons are available? Okay. So we can see first home cooked diet, home cooked diet that contains a suitable novel protein. Novel protein is exotic protein, which the animal is not already previously exposed to and a carbohydrate source. It is the gold standard option. It is the best option you have. If you're going to follow it and you know uh, compliance from the owner and uh, you're going to do it, it's going to be a fantastic uh, you know, success. And contains no additives. Yes, of course, you will not be you will not be adding anything artificial. You will be natural most of the times and not contaminated with other sources. But the disadvantages time consuming, little bit cost may be higher sometimes and sometimes palatability animal may you know, refuse to uh, return to commercial food. Yes, and check it is nutritionally balanced and it may not be suitable for long term feeding because of the animal may put on weight because of the. You know, fa uh, uh, because of the obesity. Yeah, so commercial limited second second option is the uh, commercially available novel proteins. Novel proteins are straightforward. You can just you know go for exotic protein and check whether and it is a new nutritionally balanced and it moderately cost. And important point here about the novel protein diet is that it is suitable for most of the animals for a long term feeding. Yeah, what are the disadvantages? Labeling is confusing for owners. Sometimes Label says something, yes. And there are studies which suggest that up to 80% of these novel proteins, what they claim in the labels, they contained undeclared protein sources, which might be causing allergies to get the pets. Finally, the hydrolyzed proteins, protein hydrolyzation and ultra filtration leading to straightforward and convenient. It's available across, it's available already. So nutritionally balanced, yes. And it is also suitable for most animals, most pets for a long term feeding. And what are all the uh, you know drawbacks? Ingredients and degree of hydrolysis, extensive hydrolysis is required. If not, there will be a chance that could trigger the allergen. That will not be the right option to go for. And cost, high cost. I told you right uh, because of the you know ultra filtration, because of the hydrolysis process, it you know it's going to cost a lot for the pet food manufacturers. So and they are going to you know sell it in a higher price so cost sometimes you know, you can also see gi upsets and also weight gain because of the hydrolysis process sometimes they may be little bit less tasty for the pets as well so the gold standard is home cooked if the owners compliance and we do the right thing right, right amount of you know for one exotic novel protein and a carbohydrate source with the complete and balanced diet Definitely it's going to work well. Yeah. So duration of elimination diet, how much time, how much time you have to wait for the you have to do the elimination diet. The study, latest study from uh, Olivier and Muller suggests that almost 50% of the dogs and cats, they actually, you know, uh, be able to uh, respond uh, to the, uh, the response in three weeks each time. And almost 80 to 85 percentage of the dogs and cats up to five weeks, they took up to five weeks. And you want to achieve 90 to 95 percentage of the elimination diet trial up to eight weeks time it has taken. So what is recommended? Don't get confused with this slide. The recommended dietary duration of elimination trial for dogs and cats. For dogs it is five to eight weeks and for cats it is six to eight weeks. So please keep it in mind whenever you are actually putting the dog or a cat on the dietary elimination trial. You should at least go for a minimum of five to eight weeks 
in order to get the maximum result out of it. And for cats, it is six to eight weeks. So please keep in mind recommended duration of elimination diet in dogs and cats. Yes. And sometimes there are possibilities. Is there a possibility for a shorter uh, elimination dietary trial? Yes, there are possibilities where you can actually go for a, uh, a regular dose of 0.5 mg per kg body weight uh, of our uh, you know, glucocorticoids and so on. Yes, and this is advised. This 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 uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, administration of glucocorticoids. What are all the advantages? Sometimes you know the owners complains they may not be able to spend time for five to eight weeks. So sometimes it can actually shorten the you know possibility of elimination dietary trial, and also it could reduce the flares due to secondary infections. But one should keep it in mind it is not actually you know uh, uh, recommended in all the cases. It is variable to case to case because in some a lot of reports suggest that this glucocorticoids in some cases it works fine, in some cases it does not, and it takes time. So it's a variable results you will be able to go into see. And once you, if you use the glucocorticoid for the uh, shortening of the elimination dietary trial, you should make sure that two weeks withdrawal you know, period for this steroid is required. Once after you use the steroid, two weeks you must wait, and then you should go for a, you know, elimination and provocation case. So what is the recommended diagnostic pathway? So elimination diet, one should see clinical science. First, put the dog or a cat for, for, for about, you know, Five to six, five to eight weeks, or six to eight weeks time. See if the clinical signs improve. See if the clinical signs improve. Once the clinical signs seems to be improved, in, reintroduce the previous diet. What that actually the uh, dog was actually being given. Reintroduce the previous diet, and wait for the clinical signs to recur. Whether the clinical signs of you know itching, scratching, you know licking the paws, all these things come back. Check, and if it comes back, return to the elimination diet, and uh, if the clinical signs improve, it is a confirmed case of cutaneous adverse food reactions. Go for an elimination diet, wait for the clinical signs to improve, reintroduce the previous diet. After reintroducing, check whether all the you know signs of itching, scratching, uh, leaking, all these things comes back. And again, go back to the elimination diet. The clinical signs improve, it is confirmed because of the in, you know because of the food you know that is what is causing the allergy that is confirmed so you can actually eliminate that food substance from the lifetime for the from the pet's life and if not improved just look for if the clinical signs not improved after the you know dietary elimination trial just see it could be either you know no it could it may not be sometimes put in a surplus food reactions okay similarly you can check for all the allergens offending allergens as in every two weeks period time so once the elimination trial is given, what is the timeline for FLAR? So time to FLAR after the offending oral food challenge. Yeah, the study suggests that it could be from vary from one day to 14 days. It could be vary from one day to 14 days, but for a you know confirmative diagnosis, one should wait. One should wait for the 90 percentage of the test subjects to be manifesting the clinical signs. Dogs, one should wait for 14 days and for cats, one should wait for seven days. So after you give the after you start, you know, after you have completed the eight weeks the elimination trial, when you are reintroducing the old food, wait for 14 days, up to 14 days in dogs and wait for up to seven days in cats. So if it does not trigger any, uh, you know, uh, allergic reaction, then that uh, that food is not actually allergic to the dog. You can keep continuing and check with other protein source, check with other protein source. So like that one by one, you can actually eliminate. Yeah. And what is the latest study say? The latest study say suggests that after the elimination trial, after elimination or putting under the dog uh, in the hypoallergenic diet, even sometimes majority of the cases, up to 60 percentage of the cases, they can actually, you know, uh, sort the flare within the 12 hours time, less than 12 hours time. So this recent study suggests that at most 60 percentage of the cases, you can see the uh, you know, uh, re uh, occurring of the uh, you know scratching clinical signs within one day time. So that is the latest latest study suggested. Okay, and latest study also found out what are all the body sites affected. This you can always very well tell your owners as well. 
we can always tell the owners look for the time after the introduction of the old diet how much time it is taking for your you know pets to scratch wait for up to 14 days in dogs wait for up to 7 days in cats and also after the re challenge of the old diet they actually showed typical you know skin lesions or you know scratching licking most of majority of the cases were actually on the limbs licking the paws where of the most of the cases were with the licking the paws allergy and face was the second most commonly affected and lips was the third and then ear eyelid and ear pinna neck abdomen so this is how it this order goes this picture also clearly shows that after the reintroduction of the offending allergen majority of the cases showed clinical signs in the limbs face lips eyelid and ear pinna just keep in mind and tell your owners uh, tell the pet owners they have to observe where the pet start itching and till what time they have to wait yeah so you have followed the clinical elimination dietary trial and uh, what did i miss what did i miss sometimes it may not be effective as effective at as it is supposed to be so is is it because of the supplement sometimes we may not be knowing when when the dog is under the, the elimination trial you cannot actually you know give any supplements uh, and any additives a toys chews with animal proteins this could actually you know trigger allergic reaction cross contamination cross contamination with the other sources of animal species cross reactivity for example like storage mites actually you know and uh, which share a similar relationship with the derma house dust mite can cause cross reactivity rule out all other skin diseases did we do that first first and foremost we have to do that rule out all other skin diseases and narrow it down to uh, you know uh, a food allergy and then confirm it with elimination and provocation trial and make sure you inform all the people in the house so put it uh, put the when the dog is under elimination trial make sure everyone you know follows the strict dietary trial and tablets and syrups sometimes yeah they can as actually cause you know sometimes allergic triggers and food transition is allowed that is also one thing you have to you know actually look into it yeah what are all the other you know important reasons for the dietary trial is not helping food contamination lack of owners compliance owner may not actually strictly follow the you know uh, elimination trial false labeling claims label might say something but he actually you know what is inside may be something different non allergic pruritis diseases did we rule out first yes atopic dermatitis yes of course this could also you know uh, you, you know actually you know be on uh, it could be a concurrent with a cutaneous adverse food reactions residual allergenic fragments in the allergic uh, hydrolyzed diets sometimes the equipments which are actually used for manufacturing the pet foods are they cleaned every time or any residual fragments of the previous you know diet or the previous protein source or any hydrolyzed diet is still there which is causing the allergen you should actually check yes labels you should actually check for the labels labels not always right not always right they might claim something but you know actually something will be else will be there this study by olivier and muller suggested that almost 83 percentage of the you know dog foods which they have taken into study 83 percentage have a misled labelings mislabeled ingredients label is something and you know actually ingredients is something different and are almost 83 percentage of the 33 to 83 percentage of the food foods mislabeled with novel or limited ingredients but actually you know contain some other offending ingredient and luckily or you know interestingly uh, hydrolyzed diets whatever taken into consideration into the study majority of the times they did not have any offending allergens hydrolyzed diets okay so please actually uh, please be careful when you are choosing the you know uh, when you are you know reading the labels the label might read something but it could actually have the allergen something else please make sure the offending allergen is removed otherwise the trial will not work out right okay mislabel management what to do one uh, you know about the mislabel yes rate of pet food mislabeling is you know because of the food ingredients higher than reported now actually the rate of you know mislabeling is actually higher and cross contamination because of the you know improper cleaning uh, of the you know production things cross contamination is one of the possibility and also pet food label sometimes they miss to mention the uh, some, sometimes they miss to mention the uh, actual ingredient which is available so what are all the solutions 
the type of allergens recognized by the patient's immune system that's very important because each individual is different mislabeled uh, sometimes also lead to amount of mislead allergens present and degree of hypersensitivity sometimes even if it is there also we should actually you know rule out all the mislabeled things and hydrolyzation a recent studies uh, by olivier and uh, at all olivier et al suggested that the meat and the hydrolyzation is it is it actually you know partial or you know complete or extensive hydrolyzation some because the study suggests very clearly that the partial hydrolyzation partial hydrolyzation actually triggered allergic uh, you know uh, reactions in uh, you know some of the dogs and cats and extensive hydrolyzation is very much required in order to not to elicitate any clinical uh, you know allergic reactions extensive hydrolyzation is very very important for the ige system to not to actually you know pick up and react with yeah and also we should uh, be aware that undeclared sources of animal allergen this study by ricky et al suggests that in the duck meat actually it should be avian family but they actually the pcr result suggested that avian fish and mammalian so there are cross contaminations are very very commonly you know available so this actually could lead uh, lead us to the false diagnosis or failure of you know elimination diet or to you know our our success it can actually hamper our success in terms of confirming the food allergy in dogs and cats and one should also be you know keeping in mind that storage mites are potential allergens storage mites whenever you are storing the food uh, dry food especially even if it is hypoallergenic food when it is not properly stored there are highly likelihood that uh, you know the uh, uh, storage mites actually go and contaminate it and uh, they might actually you know actually you know be available in the kibbles and they can actually act, cause allergic reaction the allergic reaction is very important because this especially the tyrophagus family actually you know uh, share a cross reactivity with dermatophagitis which is a common dust mite so this could actually trigger the allergic reaction in dogs and cats so what should you do you should store the commercial dry fruits uh, dry dry foods you know indoors and in a temperate condition you should store it in a dry area and indoors always and in a dry area seal the bags most always keep it sealed to reduce the risk of contamination and also most of the you know majority of the times please go for a newly purchased bags for both elimination and also for the you know after challenge yes and if you are unsure about the you know storage and if you are not sure about the bags how it is stored or how it is contaminated go for a home cooked dietary trial this is what is the solution yes now finally an allergenic what do you mean by an allergenic an extensive level of protein hydrolysis so which does not actually you know cause a cross contamination which does not have any uh, you know cross contamination which does not trigger any clinical uh, you know reaction to the allergic substances that is called as an allergenic diet this can be very well used for diagnosis and this can be very much used in the diagnosis and clinical management of pets with allergic food or this recent study suggested that this royal canin an allergenic diet also is one you know uh, excellent uh, uh, extensive hypoallergenic uh, diet for the elimination dietary trial yeah so balanced home cooked diet if someone wanted to choose a balanced home cooked diet what are all the options available yeah for a cat it is recommended to go for a cooked potatoes and rice and uh, probably a duck and rabbit and a dicalcium phosphate to make sure the calcium is pro sufficiently provided safflower oil and a little bit of salt and uh, natural uh, natural made multimax vitamin minerals and uh, for cats it is always required to be added the three um, taurine for their you know uh, cardiac uh, healthy so cardiac health so one can actually you know also go for a dietary uh, uh, elimination trial with a home cooked diet with the owner's compliance and with one single novel protein source yes so be strict during the elimination trial this is very very important don't feed anything on from the table okay don't feed any table food raw oils treats avoid everything medication in the food check whether are you giving any medication in the food using flavored toothpaste that also sometimes cause allergic triggers giving medication a gelatin capsule sometimes causes sometimes even the flavored drugs like chewable tablets they also can actually you know elicit or trigger the allergic reaction 
dogs eating other animal species sometimes it's rare but still you know there are possibilities that it can actually trigger and crumbs on the floor mistakenly if the dog is ingested if it is allergic it's going to even if the dog is on elimination diet that may not be giving the right results and even what the study suggests that licking other pets empty bowl even if it's licking after if it is you know before cleaning the empty bowl of other pet sometimes it causes or triggers an allergic flare in the dogs and cats so be strict during the elimination trial that is a very very important thing so so just to uh, make sure that the elimination trial is taken pro you know very very promptly yeah yes so with this i'm um, just uh, you know concluding uh, the presentation if you have any questions probably we can take now Dr. Bala, Dr. Bala, Dr. Bala, Dr. Bala. Okay. I think my, my voice my is speaking. Voice is speaking. One particular observation, one particular observation which has been put by people, put by people, that is that is my voice echoing? Is my voice echoing? Yeah. Or is it okay? Or is it okay? You have echo of your yeah. echo of your. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. One common question I experience of uh, people is that uh, people is that uh, the uh, such the, reactions uh, uh, reactions uh, at the time they are diagnosed the getting they are diagnosed, diagnosed they are usually they are usually so any guidance on that any guidance on that so what what is the question please come again by the time someone the time dies, someone dies, food allergic reaction food allergic reaction the time has passed by. So has some passed is, by. So some is, 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 is early diagnosis. Early diagnosis. Correct. Uh, see, actually, this as uh, you know, the definition of the food allergy says. Okay, as it says very clearly, it is non-seasonal. Okay, so it can be uh, throughout the year because as as uh, as and when the allergic sources, you know, uh, funding allergen sources given to the or ex, you know, pet is exposed to the allergen source, it is going to trigger the actual uh, you know immune mediated inflammatory response. In turn, the, it is going to cause itching and uh, gastrointestinal signs. It is going to be persistent, and if you are not you know diagnosing it early, it is going to make the condition worse and the secondary self-induced uh, trauma, alopecia, uh, hyperpigmentation, uh, hyperkeratinization, uh, all these things are possibilities. So yeah, yeah one should actually confirm, uh, you know, if you are suspecting a, a food allergy, eliminate all other causes, eliminate all other causes of, uh, you know, pruritis, starting from, you know, your uh, uh, you know, starting from all the mites and then secondary bacterial infections and other causes of allergic sources and, uh, you know, uh, uh, other causes of allergens. Just remove everything, narrow it down to uh, 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 adverse food reactions and then go for an elimination trial. You can always go for an elimination trial, which is going to be uh, very strictly followed for six to eight weeks in dogs. It is with the right uh, uh, novel protein or a hydrolyzed protein or a home cooked hypoallergenic diet, and then look for uh, wait for uh, you know eight weeks and then reintroduce the offending allergen, and definitely it, it will actually trigger the inflammatory reaction. So put the dog on elimination trial. It will go, it is it will actually make the dog calm and uh, all the signs will go away, even if it is not actually showing any clinical signs. All the signs clinical signs will wave off. And then reintroduce, reintroduce one by one, and then you will be able to definitely diagnose it at any point in time. Thank you. Thank the you. next question is: the next uh, question is, uh, do, can you recommend a home? Can you recommend a home? Food? Food? Sorry. Home, home food. food. Home, home food. food. Yeah. We yeah. can. We can. Yeah. Yeah. The ingredient should be. The duck ingredient duck. should be duck. Uh, Duck or uh, duck or uh, pork for dogs, 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 and cats. dogs and cats. Both. 
shall I pause this? I think I can see you people. Yeah. Another query is that Another query is that again my voice is equal. Again, my right. voice is equal. I don't know. Bala, if you can see the Bala, query. If you can see the sure. query. Let's check. Yeah, yeah. Let's A for can happen at any age. A pet can develop A for even if it's on the same diet for years. Anal prurate is one of the main symptoms. It's postulated that pets with A for may respond to corticosteroid in early stages and may not respond to steroids in later stages. Yes. Is yes. Is it true? Steroid. Is it true? Steroid. Steroid will have a partial response. It is uh, it is not all. Uh, so in the uh, so in the uh, B type of uh, response, type of uh, response. Balaguru, you tell. Balaguru, you tell. Yes, actually, you know, like uh, this uh, glucocorticoid response, there are, you know, various studies are available. You know, the studies suggest that, you know, initial response in, uh, in can be seen in few of the cases and few are not actually responding in initial cases as well. It is variable from case to case. So, uh, you, you know, probably, you know, whenever, if, you, if at all you are going to use the glucocorticoid as well, it is recommended to go for a, you know, uh, glucocorticoid therapy for a two weeks. And then wait for the withdrawal of glucocorticoids up, uh, for up about two weeks, 14 days, and then go for the elimination dietary trial. So that is I, that will actually help in terms of uh, identifying the allergens. Yes. And uh, next question is on all spits on elimination trials are to be given even chewable toys. It can also cause uh, trigger allergic reaction. Is so yes. Because of the coloring agents, the coloring agents. Because of the coloring agents and uh, you know sometimes in the the flavoring agents which is available in medication, some of the drugs and the syrups that is also sometimes could actually trigger the allergic responses. So one should be very careful, or else they have to go for a hypoallergenic treat. Uh, homemade formula for dogs. So as it is recommended very well, see uh, recommended uh, homemade formula for dogs are pork. You can uh, choose the pork protein, duck protein and fish protein uh, very well and a carbohydrate source probably uh, potato, rice potato <clears throat> and uh, along with that we should make sure that the you know diet is you know enriched with calcium, dicalcium phosphate and uh, some vitamins and minerals which are actually not containing any artificial you know flavors and uh, uh, sub uh, other supplements in order to make sure it is the novel protein. The point is that dog should be given dog or dog should be or the cat should be given the exotic protein, which it is not already been exposed to the uh, in its lifetime. So yeah, that is how one should actually manage the uh, dietary formula for homemade for dogs. What should be, what can be the what first line of treatment? The first line of treatment or cases of uh, food, cases allergic of, uh, food allergic food allergic. Avoid the food which is Avoid causing the food which is causing. First line, sir. First this line, is after sir. diagnosis. This is after diagnosis. Actually, if you if you actually you know start uh, treating it uh, with any glucocorticoid or something, it might not actually you know uh, be able is uh, one might not be able to actually diagnose it. So the best way to diagnose a cutaneous adverse food reaction, eliminate all other causes. Bring it down, uh, narrow it down to CAFR, and then go for elimination trial and re-provocation. So that is going to confirm the uh, food allergy in dogs and cats. Uh, food causing uh, that. Food causing that. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. Any chances of uh, any chances of, of, CAS, of CAS, FR in older FR dogs? in older dogs. Both Dr. Nagaraj and both, both my Nagaraj and both my. Uh, why is yes. he going? Why yes. is he going? Yes, it is possible. Yes, it is possible. Like in human, like in human, human have in uh, have dog, in uh, cat which are developing which are developing in the latter days. In the latter days. For food. For food. So the available literature also suggests that a dog can actually, you know, uh, 
show signs of food allergy starting from 1 month to 13 years of age so it can happen any time in the within the time period so one must be able to actually identify it at the earliest to eliminate the offending allergens to make sure uh, we provide the quality life for the pets can we have plant can proteins have also plant as a proteins also as an allergen to for dog to for dog definitely yeah. definitely yeah uh, we have to uh, find, we have to uh, find out this causing allergy is causing allergy we have to avoid that we have to avoid that my voice is my voice is both both yours and mine is both yours and mine is equal i think uh, i think because uh, our voice is equal our and, voice is equaling and, and we are not able to we are not able to the questions properly the questions so, properly so we thank uh, dr we thank Balak, dr balakru for his elaborate presentation his elaborate presentation on a very different topic on a very and, different topic and and should be very and good and should be very important for us. important for us. thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nitin sir, Dr. Nitin sir, Dr. Raman from Intas Pharmaceuticals, and uh, Dr. V. Nagarajan, uh, who is uh, my my mentor as well as the president AVD. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So I think, uh, yeah, I have shared whatever little bit knowledge and experience I had with the uh, allergic skin diseases. I hope it was uh, useful, and let's use it in the practice. Thank you, Dr. Thank Balaguru. you, Dr. Bye, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much.